Hey everyone in the back here, I me. Mean, I know there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a wind in the back earlier. All right, sounds good. Uh, so thank you, Maria, for the kind introduction. It's great to be up here on the big, sta the big stage. Um, so today I'll be talking about a large-scale uh, project led by Tony D'Amato and a number of other collaborators that are in the audience. Some folks uh, may have been introduced to this earlier by uh, Maria and others. Um, so we're examining adaptive subculture for climate change, and today I'll be talking about some of our first-year results, looking at some of our transitional strategies, examining perhaps species range shifts and some of the performance of these uh, transitional strategies. So, kicking things off, um, in a time of uncertainty, forest management is increasingly being viewed as a central component for climate change. Um, adaptation planning. So for natural resource planners, scientists, policy makers, um, all of these groups need robust operational tools to integrate climate change and adaptation um, into the landscape. All of these uh, strategies, some of these strategies may foster resilience to the impacts of climate change or enable some level of adaptation um, at a time of uncertainty. So a figure or some terms that folks are starting to uh, that was introduced earlier by Maria and others. Um, Silvicultural strategies for climate change uh, can be presented along the continuum. Those strategies that are most uh, conservative or resist the effects of climate change, all the way up to those that uh, enable them, uh, some level of adaptation um, to these responses. So, uh, just a quick overview uh, resistance strategies, these are strategies that maintain relatively unchanged forest conditions. So in a northern part of the system, this may be single tree selection, uh, good forestry, reducing the density, um, and improving the forest's own defenses from these uh, projected disturbances. Uh, perhaps a middle road approach would be a resilience approach. And these are strategies that accommodate some level of change, but encourage a return to prior desired reference condition. So in a forest, this may be increasing the heterogeneity or structural variability on the landscape, species diversity, functional diversity on the landscape. All of these um, strategies allow for multiple pathways for recovery and stand to recover from a disturbance. And then lastly, on the most extreme end of things, and uh, really the highlight of the talk that I'll be giving today, are our transitional strategies. And many of these approaches are largely additive, but the cornerstone of this, um, these transitional approaches that I'll be talking about are uh, uh, species range shifts. So, uh, transitional approaches facilitate change and encourage ecosystems to adaptively respond to new or changing conditions. So, putting this into a little bit of a context, oftentimes folks talk about assisted migration as a means of transitioning and looking uh, at species range shifts. But assisted migration in the context of forestry is a little bit different. So, historically, assisted migration is spoken in the literature, talked about as a species rescue um, model. So uh, species rescue, focus on species of uh, conservation concern, likely with limited suitable habitats, and often uh, migrations well outside of their natural range. In the context of forestry, we're talking about species that may be currently widespread, commercially grown, um, the autocology of these species is already well known, and in terms of migrations, we're talking about speed up, uh, shifts in range that may be within the current, current range limits and envelope, or perhaps with modest range extensions. That's really all you're going to hear me talk about in terms of assisted migration, because in the context of our silvicultural work in transition, it's really just one component. Uh, other aspects of transitional silviculture uh, include tr uh, harvest treatments that may favor future adapted species that are currently on site, but may make up a lesser component of the forest perhaps planting of those same species, or sourcing species outside of the known historic range uh, to include a more subtly genotype, and then lastly, the assisted uh, rain migration um, of new and future adapted species. So I've used this term future adapted a, a few times, and there's a few measures to be able to look at this. Uh, today I'm largely talking about the Atlas of the District model, which folks are probably familiar with. Um, this model looks at uh, species range shifts, so there are species that are projected to have a perhaps a decrease in their range, those that may have no change, or those with a uh, perhaps increase in those that may be more potentially future adapted. However, there are species-specific characteristics from the syllabics that may modify the performance of these species uh, in comparison to those models, 
those that may perform better, better model projections, and those that may uh, perhaps be negative modifying traits. But for the purpose of this talk, we're actually moving forward with the district model. But this is important for managers to think about how bringing species like this onto uh, the site. We can talk a little bit more of that later. So switching gears a little bit and talking about this large-scale adaptive silviculture for climate change project. This is a project led by Tony and a number of other folks here, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's a large national experiment with five installations throughout the nation, uh, each representing a unique and important forest and ecosystem. So today I'll largely be talking about the second college grant site in northern New Hampshire and Coos County. Um, uh, this is one of the largest experiments of its kind, in, especially in northern New England. Um, Silvicultural treatments are developed along the same continuum that have been introduced earlier, the resistance, resilience, transitional treatments, and were developed in concert with uh, local managers as well as regional scientists. Um, and this experiment is replicated and operational and translated um, to on the ground. So it both works within science as well as at a management level. Zooming in a little bit more to the uh, Northern uh, Second College grant site in northern New Hampshire. So that in the middle image, we have an uh, overlay of half the experiment. So each polygon is about 10 hectares or 25 acres, and each represents the different treatment types that we've been introducing, the resistance, resilience, and transition. We also have a um, control or reference stand. And in the three images, you can start to see the differences in how these treatments and harvest uh, are, are playing out. So in our resistance stand, in the 70 or 80 square feet of basal area, so reducing the density, resilience, starting to create a little bit more of a patchwork, some gaps as well as some reserves, high up islands of trees, and then in our transitional treatments, incorporating some larger gaps that may allow for the regeneration of currently on-site future adaptive species, as well as incorporating uh, new seedlings um, that may be future adaptive. So we planted 6,500 uh, seedlings and seed American chestnut in four replicates in two harvest uh, treatment types. So we have 0.1 hectare or quarter acre gaps and 0.4 hectare uh, one acre uh, harvest openings. There are nine species selected from a suite of functional traits. Uh, oftentimes folks wonder where these, these uh, species came from. They were selected from, from the, our research group demo, uh, democratically from our model projections, site characteristics, and management objectives. I do want to emphasize that we, uh, the group spent a considerable amount of time thinking about the functional redundancy of these species being introduced to the site, as well as in comparison to those that are current on site. So jumping into some of our first year results, um, here we're looking at a histogram of, of, histogram of survival or uh, vigor um, across our nine species. We're specifically looking at our quarter acre gaps right here. Right now we're not seeing tremendous differences between our treatments and our quarter or our acre treatments. Um, in general, there's higher mortality in the acre gaps, more exposure, but nothing that's really significantly different. But what I want to direct your attention to is a staggered response between species. So some species are responding better with higher survival. Red oak, red spruce, white pine, the species that are perhaps a little bit uh, currently on site or within that range, and then species such as black cherry, uh, a little bit more future adapted with much uh, greater mortality. Um, a couple other uh, sh stories to share here is a black birch, one of the bigger uh, stems that we planted was about a meter tall when we put it in the ground. We're seeing quite a bit more categorized as low vigor. We'll get into that a little bit more later, but we're seeing uh, quite a bit of dieback with, with uh, black birch, as well as uh, some of our eastern hemlock you know, uh, leaf uh, tree that went in the ground uh, and experienced a little bit of a, a harsher growing conditions early on. Uh, another species of interest, bitternut hickory. Uh, our initial assessments two weeks after planting, we saw about, we, were, we assessed around 30 or 40 percent survival, and at this point they look to be doing quite a bit better, almost around 80 percent, due to its vigorous ability to be able to root throughout. So, important um, trait for some of our species. Zooming in a little bit more and lumping them by future adaptability, we're seeing an interesting, potentially a lag response. So those species that are categorized or projected to decrease in range appear to be performing or surviving better compared to those that are uh, perhaps projected to increase. Uh, teasing apart what's going on between our uh, 
species projected to have no change or increase is a little bit still working on what that story is, but let's remember that this is the first year of results and seedlings are experiencing their first winters. Um, so over the next several years, as they grow a little bit higher, get above snowpack, and experience a true New England winter, you might see a little bit more divergence in, in that story there. But there's still quite a bit going on in the background here in terms of the species traits, perhaps the magnitude of shift that each seedling has experienced in terms of latitude or mean centroid distance. Uh, examining the role of uh, stock, so the size of the seedling prior to planting. Um, again, each seedling was measured for height, root collar diameter, uh, in the, immediately after planting, and then um, in our first, at the end of the first growing season. Both figures here um, are on the x-axis, we're looking at root collar diameter, so the size of that stock. In the left figure, we see survival. And we see a, a positive relationship, or a relationship between root collar diameter and a threshold um, in survival. So there's a steep uh, increase in survival, or decrease, whichever way you're going. And at around five millimeters or so, we start to see a threshold um, in survival at around 80 percent. Now there's still quite a bit of spread around our line in our, own, in our model, and we're only explaining around 27 percent of the variance. Um, so there's still quite a bit going on in the background in terms of species and uh, variability within each species in terms of size. But when we look to the right figure, we categorize these uh, root colors by size class um, and comparing uh, to relative growth rates and how much growth in terms of vertical height um, these seedlings um, attained over the course of the growing season. The red dotted line at the zero mark, anything above that would be positive growth, anything below that would be negative or dieback. The initial assessment looks like smaller size seedlings while are, are, have higher mortality or grow, are actually growing more, but really the story here is that those intermediate and large size classes, despite having higher survival, are actually dying back and we're seeing um, considerably more fun crossing that zero threshold. So there, the trade-off here is um, higher survival in our larger size classes and lower figure associated with that. And just examining some regional trends, uh, we've also replicated a small portion of this experiment in two other research forests in the, in the University of Vermont. We've got Walcott Mixedwood Forest in Walcott, Vermont, um, and the Washington Pure Sugar Maple Stand in uh, Washington, uh, Vermont. And so, still trying to tease apart what the story is here, but we're seeing a little bit of a separation between survival and performance in these sites, specifically uh, between our New Hampshire site and the Wal Walcott experiment. Looking at the right figure, um, examining uh, survival against, say, pre precipitation, our get gut check is that this past year in Vermont and in New Hampshire and over, over New England is really hot, really dry. Our drought indices were through the roof. And so just simply plotting days since planting um, against precipitation, in our New Hampshire site, we saw many of our seedlings experiencing a wetting period uh, between one and five year, uh, five days after planting. Um, but in Washington and Walcott, we're seeing uh, these seedlings did not experience substantial rainfall for 11, 14 days afterwards. So I'm not a gardener, but I do know that plants that aren't watered after two weeks tend to perform worse. Um, jokes aside, I think this is a really important data point when we're talking about extreme uh, climate events, and this may be an important climate analog um, for seedlings going forward, and uh, note for man management. So to put a bow on this, what does this all mean? Um, in a regeneration-heavy northern um, uh, soil cultural system, transitional soil culture is just starting to become part of the dialogue and really uh, isn't part of our culture and history. Uh, we currently don't have the operational infrastructure built into a lot of our systems in terms of the cost or labor being allocated towards planting or shifting uh, species ranges. Um, looking at the stock availability in terms of nurseries, the number of nurseries uh, that has been on the decline, and the, there's very little empirical work on the subject. And then lastly, putting this in the context of the broader adaptive civil culture the climate change project, where we're monitoring regeneration over decades to come, it'll be really interesting to see how this lags species survival and performance 
performs against what we're seeing, what we would call it strong system inertia. How are these species perform against us, uh, the environment strong sugar maple and peach? And so, just lastly, uh, some future work will be assessing these seedlings over the next few years, looking at some abiotic and biotic factors. But this is an experiment that we've been running for multiple decades, so it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. And then, lastly, we're taking um, and a different approach in taking and looking at these seedling responses, both seedling and seed, and starting to turn the dials a little bit and doing some plant manipulation to see how these seedlings will respond in terms of their plasticity and adaptive response under shifting precipitation scenarios. So, with that, I'm close to being done with my time, so thank you all, and I think I might have time for a question or two. We do have time for uh, one, maybe two questions. That's pretty loud. Have you, uh, have you done any uh, uh, coordination with the landscape or nursery uh, uh, folks? Because they've done a lot of research on uh, transplants of various species and how adaptable they are. How, how they uh, do the shock of a, of a certain species that will uh, make up for that in a year or two. I would think that you might want to correlate with some of the research they're doing, even though it was going to be in a landscape setting versus a forest setting. I think from a species-specific standpoint, you'll find a lot of information that will be useful for you. Great. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Of corner you a little bit later and talk a little bit more about that. This isn't something that we've directly had a conversation with um, folks yet, but we do are, are well aware of a lot of the provenance studies that have been done historically looking at species performance. So pick your brain a little bit later. Thanks for that. Alright, uh, Nick, you had a question? So the question was, are we seeing much pressure from herbivory? Um, so in our northern sites in New Hampshire, uh, we're not seeing a tremendous amount. How we're dealing with that is 50% of our seedlings are caged. Um, seedling seeds, the American chestnut seeds are in um, a solid cage, and 50% of the seedlings are caged in a, a mesh tubing. Um, we're not seeing tremendous pressure from that in New Hampshire, largely because of low deer numbers and moose numbers. Um, but in our um, Vermont sites, we certainly are seeing that pressure. Again, same model in terms of how we're engaging them. So, good question. Yes, sir. 